Well, good evening. What did it? How are we doing this evening? Are we all good with English? <laughs> okay, we will do it. If it doesn't work too well, then please let me know, and then we'll change it, or we'll mix it, or we do Spanglish. Uh, that's Spanish and English, right? Or Germlish, uh, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, it's very, I'm very glad to be here this evening. Uh, we've already had a lot of fun here in Belize. I'm really amazed. Usually in, uh, in Seminole, we start the service and we end with sweating. By the time I'm finished, I have sweated some. Here we have sweated all day, and so we're going to start sweating. I hope it quits before we finish. Uh, I'm not sure if you're backwards all the way here or not, but um, anyway, um, I would like to um, start with reading a little bit from an article. We're talking about marriage here, all right? Now, before I read that, I'm amazed How many of you couples here are married longer than 20 years? Oh, I get it. All the young ones are sitting back there. I was looking from where we were sitting, and I was only seeing older people. And I'm thinking, hey, you guys are, are, uh, maybe you ought to be teaching me here. (laughs) You have more experience. But anyway... We're going to spend this week talking about marriage. So let me just say a couple of things about that. Uh, This is a very, very important topic to me. Number one, because I am married. And uh, when I said I do, I meant I do. And part of what I meant was that divorce will never be a part of our discussion. Or is not something that I will ever consider. So therefore, it doesn't matter what happens. We're going to have to make it work. So if something really tough happens, well, we're going to just have to, we, we will make it work, whatever it takes. And so therefore, uh, I, I, I did take it seriously and uh, came to realize very quickly that in order to be married and to remain married and to remain happily married, took a lot of work. And there were, it was a point in time when I finally realized, well, if we're going to be married anyway and we're going to be stuck with each other for the rest of our lives, we may as well enjoy it. So let's find out what it takes to enjoy it. <laughs> And so that's, that's, uh, so we started to learn a lot. Here's a, here's a man who has written about marriage and uh, family and all kinds of things over the years. And he uh, uh, wrote something in an article that I decided, you know, I read this and, it, and I thought it was very good. And it's about resolving conflict in a marriage where a husband and wife don't agree with each other or they need to work through a problem. And this is what he writes. When my wife Barbie and I were first married, we had conflicts about conflict. Looking back, it's kind of funny because I later went on to write a Christian relationship book called Boundaries in Marriage. Imagine watching us have boundary conversations about how bad our marriage boundaries were. (laughs) They were writing about problems that they were themselves in the middle of. Barbie's approach to conflict was to avoid it. My approach tended to be more blunt. We'd talk about a problem, and it wouldn't go very well. You ever had tried to talk about a problem, and it didn't go well? <laughs> yeah? All right. Well, welcome to the club. One of us would misunderstand. We would pull away from each other, and the problem would not get solved. One day, I asked Barbie, when we argue, I never stop loving you. Is there anything I can do to make this better for you? She thought for a minute and said, Maybe if you let me know you love me before you confront me with the problem, that might help. That was a good idea, so I agreed. The next time I wanted to have a talk with her about a concern, I walked in the room and said something like this. Honey, I just want to let you know that I really care about you. And I hope you feel safe with me. Then I brought up the problem, and things went better for her and for us. This method of having successful conversations went on for a while. As time passed, however, something changed. I needed to bring up an issue, so I began with, Honey, 
I just want you to know, Barbie interrupted and said, stop. It's okay. I know you love me. Just get to the problem. (laughs) We had a good laugh about it, and over time, she began feeling safe enough not to need reassurance before each conversation. So she realized I loved her even in the midst of confrontation, and she was ready to go straight to problem solving. So we want to talk about marriage. I don't know what your marriage is like today. The theme for the first evening is reclaiming your marriage. Uh, This whole thing about reclaiming marriage was born out of a very difficult time in helping, trying to help some marriage married couples in our church. So I don't know what your marriage today looks like. I have no idea how you and your spouse are are relating right now, okay? So if I say something that sounds like I'm talking about you, I'm not. Unless you're a Clawson and you were at the Clawson camp for the weekend, I am talking about you. (laughs) I will talk about you. I will use you as illustrations for how not to do marriage. (laughs) Just kidding, but we were there for two days. We had a lot of fun. Maybe your marriage looks like this right now. You feel like you're about to get swallowed up and eaten up, and you're halfway swallowed up and grabbing the other one by the throat, hoping they won't swallow you all the way. The good news or, or, or the advice is don't ever, never, ever give up, all right? Or maybe yours looks like this. You're on the brink of this waterfall, and you're not sure. Do we pray or just paddle, or does, is, is anything going to help, all right? Or maybe your marriage looks like this. You're ready to shoot it out and just end it. <laughs> gonna, we're going to finish this with a feud. I pray and hope your marriage does not look like this. Can you read it? Maybe not. Not tonight, dear. I've got a headache. It's the guy laying in the bed saying this. I mean, there is something so wrong with that, isn't there? (laughs) Anyway, so we want to talk about reclaiming our marriage today. Uh, I don't know, like I said, what your marriage is like. But I want you to understand that even though I like to have some spouse and some fun and I like to joke about it, I see marriage as being probably, if not the most important target or, or the biggest target that Satan aims at, it's the second biggest. Maybe the biggest goal that Satan has is to keep you as a person away from Jesus Christ, to keep you from being saved and being saved from hell. Because if he can do that, then he will have you as a companion with him for all of eternity. But if he cannot keep you from Christ, I believe the second greatest target he has is to seek to destroy your marriage. Because if he can destroy your marriage, he will get both you and your spouse, and he also will get your children. Now, they may still become... Christians and so on, but they will experience a lot of pain, a lot of bitterness, and a lot of hurt that can ruin their chances of a lot of good things for the rest of their lives. It doesn't have to, but I believe that that's what he's trying to do. And so the scripture that uh, Dietrich already read today comes from Ephesians chapter 6, which talks about the fact that we are in a war or we are in a wrestling match, okay? Okay. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day and having done all, to stand. Now listen very, very carefully. How many of you have sometimes been in a fight with your spouse and you saw your spouse as an enemy? You felt more like an enemy or you, you saw your spouse more as an enemy than as a friend. Ever been there? You can be honest. Okay, your spouse will not bump you in the ribs. They're not allowed to poke you or to, uh, or to send you to the doghouse for the night. All right? 
Sometimes things happen and we treat each other more like enemies than we do like friends. And this scripture reminds us that our battle is not with flesh and blood. Go ahead and pinch your husbands, wives. Go ahead and pinch your husbands a little bit. Feel, see if he reacts. That's flesh and blood, okay? That is not your enemy. That's what this is saying. But it's against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness. Those are all different levels of spiritual forces or evil spirits, Satan's army, that work and are doing their utmost to try to destroy your marriage. And so we want to remember that, that we are in a war, and that, uh, that in this war, you and I have a choice. We have a choice. You can either be a traitor. Now listen, I know that I'm speaking to a church full of people that regularly go to church, right? There may be somebody here that doesn't regularly go to church. I'm assuming that all of you that are here, you're considering yourself to be Christians. If you're not, then this is a choice uh, that you have is to be a traitor. In other words, not to be on God's side. Not to be on the right side. That means you're on the wrong side. If you have not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and become a child of God and been born again, then you're a traitor. You're on the wrong side. You cannot win when you're on the wrong side. That's what I'm trying to say. Then there's another choice. You can be a prisoner of war or a POW. During the Second World War or any of the wars, when, a, when somebody got captured by the opposite side, they're taken as prisoners and they're held captive. And there's a lot of couples today that are prisoner of war or they are in some serious problems in their marriage and they think, they believe that there is no way of getting out of these problems. This is just the way life is and it's too bad, but, you know, we'll just... Suck it up and live with it. That's POW or prisoner of war mentality where we feel that we can't get out of this problem or that we have problems that there's not solutions for. And I'm here to say to you today that I believe from the bottom of my heart that there's always, always, always hope. Years ago, and what got me started in really studying about marriage back uh, about 17 years ago or so, was that we had a couple in Seminole, Texas that I loved very deeply that were involved in us coming to Texas as a pastor couple. And within a year and a half or so later, their marriage broke apart. There was some serious problems involved. And one of them ended up divorcing the other, marrying some, somebody else. And that person has remarried at least once more after that. And, and, and it has been some serious problems. And at that time, I had no idea how to help a couple. We were young married. Well, we weren't young married. We had like six children already, but we felt like young married. We certainly didn't have the answers to this serious problem that this couple was going through. And this husband came to my office a number of times, often, and, and he would weep. And sometimes I could do nothing but cry with him. And he says, how will we be able to solve this problem? And I had to just be honest with him and says, I don't know. Well, if you as the pastor don't know, then what hope is there, he said. Well, I tried to find a counselor for them that would give them hope. They went to a large church in Lubbock who had full-time, licensed, trained counselors on staff, and they went and paid him quite a bit of money and told him their story. The way he told this to me, he says, basically what the counselor said at the end, I don't think there's any hope left for your marriage. And that broke my heart. Because that is prisoner of war mentality. That's a counselor who should have the answers saying there is no hope. You're a prisoner you're, you're, you know, this is just a part of your marriage and there's no way of resolving it. And I finally said to God, I said, God, if you don't have the answers to marriage, serious marriage problems in your word, then why in the world would we even believe in you? You do have the answers. I know they are there. 
and I decided to be a Marine, a soldier, and say, it doesn't matter, matter what it takes. We're going to look, and we're going to search, and we're going to find the answers, and we're going to stick to it until we find it. It has to be there. God does have hope. There's always hope in Christ, always hope in Christ. And so, um, so that's what I'm here to tell you today, that there is always hope. And you know why Satan wants to destroy your marriage? Because he wants to not just destroy you, he wants to destroy your spouse. He wants to rob you of that relationship. He wants to rob you of your spouse, of a loving relationship. Scripture says in Ephesians 6, no, um, no, John 10 verse 10 says that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He wants to rob you of your spouse. If he can rob you of the love between you and your spouse and make it miserable, make you have more fun, greater respect at work, and want to stay long, long hours at work so you don't have to go home and be miserable with your spouse. Satan loves it. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your family. All right? And so uh, he wants to destroy your relationship. He wants to destroy your family. And I believe he wants to rob you of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. What's the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Memorize those and meditate on them about how do these relate to my marriage relationship. And if you can begin to understand that, your, you will, your, your, your marriage relationship is guaranteed to begin to change. Because God has given us the Holy Spirit uh, for, for that reason, that those fruits will live through us. He wants to destroy your testimony for God, your ministry for God. Listen, the scripture uses the marriage relationship more often than anything else in scripture to illustrate his, rela- his love for us, right? Jesus Christ is called the bridegroom, right? He's coming back for his bride. Husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He interchanges that love relationship between a husband and a wife to illustrate his love for us because that is the pure, gentle, loving relationship between a young man and a young woman is is the greatest illustration of God's just amazing love that he has for, uh, for us, for you and me. And if he can destroy the loving relationship between a husband and wife and make it bitter, angry, and destructive, and not a good picture, there's very often there's young men and women that are saying, why would I want to get married? I I don't want to live, live like my parents did. Oh, they were in the same house. But they were miserable. So that's what Satan wants to do, all right? So we want to talk about this. So I believe that God's plan, you all know this verse, Jeremiah 29, uh, 11, right? That gets quoted everywhere in any situation. So I decided to use it here in marriage. God's plan for you, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. This is God speaking, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. God has great plans for you. He has great thoughts towards you. He has great purposes for your marriage. He wants you to have hope. So, um, well, I already said this here. Reasons why Satan wants to destroy your marriage. God's illustration of his love for mankind. His goal to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants to also destroy your godly seed, and that's to get your children. Why some people never get free... Uh, when they have problems, is number one, sometimes we gain knowledge 
but we don't know how to apply it. We know we're supposed to love each other. We know we're supposed to forgive each other. We know we're supposed to learn not to be angry at each other, but sometimes we just don't know how to do it, right? I know I'm supposed to forgive, but so I say with my mouth, well, okay, I forgive you, but somehow the bitterness stays. Somehow it keeps coming back. Somehow, sometimes we take the same old stuff and we reverberate it. We know some things, we know what it should be like, but we just really don't know how to do it. Then secondly, uh, Sometimes when we uh, do something, you know, when we try to work on our relationship, we do it mentally, but not from our heart. Okay, yeah, I forgive you. Or, or if I have sinned against my spouse, and I know I'm supposed to repent and ask for forgiveness, and well, I do it mentally. Well, okay, like diha ara you doing don, help me dot to go. Right? If I have hurt you, then please forgive me. Just forgive me. I'm sorry. And sometimes we do it here. We do it from our mouth, but it doesn't really come from the heart. And so we don't know how to really do it from the heart. And so things don't get resolved, and somehow it keeps coming back. So we respond to problems sometimes. If there's a problem in a marriage relationship, sometimes we respond in one of three ways. Uh, Well, we don't have a problem. (laughs) We don't have a problem. You know, years ago... Uh, we had been in Seminole for, well, we were there for a couple of months. We had a fire in the house that we were staying in. We were renting a house, and right Christmas morning, we had our family gathering with our kids, and we were sitting around the fireplace. I started this fire that we hadn't, I don't, I don't know if you'd used it before or not, but, but we didn't know that the chimney was all smoke shut, and we started this fire, and then after, you know, we had our Christmas time, we read the Christmas story, and we prayed together and handed out our presents and so on, and we had this fire. It started in the ceiling. We were sitting down for breakfast when, when Leona all, uh, all of a sudden said, hey, Dave, look up there. There's smoke. And I ran into the next room, and I looked into the attic, and it was all on fire in there. I mean, the ceiling was all on fire inside, and we ended up having to move out for a few months. Anyway, during that time, it was very, very difficult. I mean, where do we move to? What house do we get into? And during that time, I get a phone call at about 10 o'clock at night, and this lady says to me, my husband named him, and it says, uh, he's, he's totally drunk, and he was being really stupid here in the house, so I kicked him out of the house. Would you be able to talk to him? So I drove over there, and, and I picked him up, and he denied the problem. This, <laughs> this was very typical of him. He said, so I picked him up and says, uh, your wife uh, said you were, being, you were being very inappropriate in your home, that you were starting to do things you shouldn't be doing. He says, you know, we don't have a problem in our house. My drinking is not the problem here. If my family would simply respect me the way they're supposed to, then we would have no problem in the house. We talked till 2 in the morning, by the way. And uh, by that time, he was a little bit more sober. But we, sometimes when we have a problem... Instead of, you know, instead of facing it, we deny it. If you're denying the problem, if you're not willing to admit it, you won't solve it. It's impossible to solve a problem you're not willing to admit. Or we blame somebody else. It's not my fault. It's their fault. It's my family's fault. They're not respecting me the way they, they should respect me. It's not my drinking that's the problem. It's not my behavior. It's, it's the fact that they're not respecting me. Or sometimes we say that uh, uh, about our spouse. You know, my spouse doesn't have... Uh, You know, she doesn't love me. (laughs) Uh, You know, whatever the problem may be. Uh, We blame somebody else or we rationalize it. No, no, no. I mean, this issue that's going on here, and so we give all these reasons why it's there and why we just can't help it. It's, 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 you know, it just can't be helped. This is just the way it is. All those things don't help in resolving a problem. You, if you want to solve a problem, first and foremost, you need to recognize it and to acknowledge it. Secondly, you, secondly, you need to take responsibility for your part of it. And thirdly, you don't rationalize your problem away anymore. You begin to fa- uh, uh, face it uh, head on to, uh, if, if you want to fix it. So... Um, Let me, let me ask you a question. How many of you this evening were nervous to come to a marriage seminar? 
How many of you are still, nobody nervous? You're all okay with, you didn't think, I wonder what the neighbor is going to think. If they see us go to this marriage seminar, they're obviously going to think we're having a problem. No? Nobody, nobody was nervous? Woo, yes, I like it. No problems here. Um, um, today we want to talk about learning or be, uh, beginning, uh, begin to understand the problem. Um, I want, uh, for, first of all, I want to let you know that if we want to solve a problem, we want to look at it and say, okay, what caused it? What's causing this problem? How do we biblically resolve it? Um, we, we need to realize something. How many of you have had a problem and you decided to pray about it, hoping that God would take the problem away? Okay, now let me ask you another question. For how many of you who had a problem and you prayed and asked God to take the problem away, God, just like that, took the problem away? Everyone's, there's one, okay. Most of us, you know that God is not really in the business of just taking problems away. You know that, right, by now? God is more in the business of changing people through problems. If there's problems, there's some things often that God wants to do in our life that he wants to teach us, that he wants to show us. And, uh, and uh, so he allows the problem often to stay. Let me illustrate with, with one or two stories uh, without mentioning names, but I remember years ago this lady came to my office and they were having a very serious problems in, in their marriage, and that was true. And the husband was not being nice, and that was true. As a matter of fact, it went so bad as that he threatened to commit suicide. He would get very, very angry and said, you know, if the family just wouldn't do what he would do, then he would just go and end it all. And one day, he literally took a rifle, and he loaded it, and he walked into the barn and locked the door, and a shot went off. Uh, extremely, extremely serious situation. The family, of course, is in the house, totally, totally petrified. What are we going to find in this barn? Uh, And he had not uh, killed himself. What he was doing, he was trying to control the family with fear, trying to scare them into doing whatever he wanted done, right? I mean, trying to control them with anger and with fear. That didn't work. So the wife came to my, ha- uh, to my office, and she wanted to talk about it, and she wanted me to go and talk to her husband. So I asked her, can I tell him that you came and asked me to come and talk to him? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want him to find out that I was here ever, that if he ever found out that I had talked about him, he would be very, very angry and so on. And, and I said to her, okay, so what do you think I should tell him when he asks me why I'm there? Because I've never gone there before to talk to them a, him about their marriage problem. Now, I, all of a sudden, I'm at the door, so what do I tell him? And, and uh, because if I can't tell him that you talk to me about it, the first question will be, why are you here? Who talked to you about our problems? Oh, well, nobody did. Yeah, right. By the way, I said to her, I said, then I'm lying And you know where lies come from? Scripture says that Satan is the father of all lies. In other words, all lies ultimately originate from Satan. And if I use his tool, what will we accomplish? We will accomplish his goals, which are to steal, to kill, and to destroy. You will not be able to use lies. So I believe maybe God wants to work in this situation to help her face the fear as well. Sometimes there's a problem on both sides, and God allows both of them to kind of struggle with each other because he wants to change both people, not just one. The struggles are almost, I I, I guarantee you, almost always there because God wants to change me. I know that every single uh, conflict that I've had with my wife, I ultimately came to see that I was really part of the problem that he wants to change me. God allows 
struggles to happen in order to bring out the real problem in us or, or, or the real problem get us to face ourselves, right? In other words, there's always three sides to every story, right? There's his side and then there's her side. What's the third side? The truth. There's his side and her side, and the truth is in between there somewhere. Because anytime you're part of a problem, you don't see the whole thing very clearly because we're too intimately involved in it, right? It's hard for me to see my part when I'm part of the problem. We have, we have a tendency to see the other person's side worse than it is and my side better than it really is, and therefore we're not balanced. The truth is in between there somewhere. And so uh, I have come to realize that if you want to help somebody solve a problem, it doesn't help me to take sides. So I, 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 I just never take sides. I tell them, okay, let's find out what the truth is in between here, and then let's find out what your, your contribution to this problem is and solve that, and this person's uh, contribution to the problem, solve that, and then we can solve the problem. If I take sides, if I take his side, guess what? He's not totally right. He's part of the problem. So I, if I take his side, then I am supporting his wrong, right? And I am rejecting her part that is right. Can you solve it then? No. It doesn't work. And so, so I don't take sides. So if the husband comes to my office, then we deal with his problem, with his side of it. Okay, let's look at your side of it. You know what I often get blamed for? You always take her side. Because when I come, all you do is talk to me about my problem, my part of the problem. I, yep, you got that right. The woman comes in, okay, now let's look at your side of the problem. So they blame me for always taking her, his side of the problem because you always just talk about my side of the problem. And so, you, you know, we, I want to talk about his part of it. I says, we can't solve his part of it if he's not here. Let's talk about that part that's here and solve that. So get it? There's three sides to the problem. There's his side, her side, and then the, there's a truth somewhere. If we can get both f- focused on the truth, then we can solve the problem. So um, we as human beings consist of three parts, the Bible tells us. We are body, soul, and spirit. First Thessalonians 5.23 Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, So Satan's purpose is is to uh, steal, to kill, and destroy, but Jesus has come that we may have life and we may have it abundantly. Um, So Satan does that by, well, here it says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Let's uh, jump on. Satan tries to steal, kill, and destroy by developing strongholds. Now, the reason why I started with the we are spirit, soul, and body, because where does this battle happen? It happens in our soul. Um, What is the soul? Well, let's first of all talk about these strongholds here a little bit. Satan, uh, or the Bible, explains to us where this battle happens. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments. Now, listen carefully. Verse 5 tells us where the battle happens. These strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The soul of the human being is our ability to think, to feel, and to make decisions. Satan establishes strongholds in the way we think, in, in, in arguments against every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, how we understand God, and bringing every thought, 
how we think into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ, if our thinking is not obedient to Jesus Christ, it can develop into a stronghold. Let me explain that a bit further. Um, the weapons of, this, uh, of our warfare are the sword of the Spirit, or truth, and prayer. In Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about the weapons of our warfare. All of them are there to protect us, but two of them are there to fight. One of them is the sword of the Spirit, which is truth, the Word of God. You want to fight Satan, you have to fight with the Word of God, with truth. And so if he is a liar, then you can fight him with truth, right? So he establishes strongholds of untruth in our mind or how we feel. Then he's got, he, he can destroy us. Let me continue on. Ephesians six seventeen. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which is, uh, and then Ephesians 6, 18, praying always without prayer and supplication in the Spirit. I believe that the two greatest weapons we have against Satan's strongholds is truth and prayer. And I want to illustrate that a bit further. Let me, uh, Satan establishes these strongholds by gaining opportunities in the soul or jurisdiction. Who can define for us what jurisdiction means? A place where you have authority, exactly. The constables here in Blue Creek, how far is your authority? John. All the way to Belize City? All over the country. You are like the FBI in the U.S. Mainly in Blue Creek. In in Texas, in Seminole, we have town police. Their jurisdiction is the city limits. Then we have the sheriff's department. Their jurisdiction is the whole county. And then we have the state troopers who have authority over the whole state. So different jurisdictions. Scripture tells us that Satan establishes strongholds by gaining opportunities in our soul or jurisdiction. L listen here. Ephesians 4, verse 26 and 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Be angry, yet do not sin. If you feel that anger inside of you coming up, your wife says something to you, and it's making you mad. Ever happen? <laughs> no? Okay, let's go on to the next lesson. Um, or the husband does something. He comes home and, sweetheart, I just bought a new truck. Would that kind of hook you a little bit? No? Okay, neither. Hey, what example would work here in Blue Creek? It works, it works at home, you know. <laughs> What's that? You bought a and krupa chitin. Um, you camp in the and they have some krupa you coughed. What does one of those things cost? A lot, like a hundred thousand, five hundred, half a million. Yeah, that would hook the wife a little bit. Listen, the other day you said we didn't have enough money for me to buy new shoes, and you bought a krupa. <laughs> Something happens and your anger starts to rise. It says, be angry but do not sin. Don't start saying things you shouldn't be saying. Don't swat him one across the face. You don't hit, don't, don't respond in sin. Don't get angry and bitter against the person and begin to harbor a lot of bitterness. That is also sin. In your anger, do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Wrath is when anger has kind of stayed for a while, and it's now settling in. Nor give place to the devil. When, when you begin to feel yourself getting angry, and you begin to respond in anger or in sin, then you're giving Satan an opportunity or 
place. If you look at your different, I don't know how many, what different translations you use, but different translations translate this word in different ways. Do not give place to the devil. This is New King James Version. I believe the, NA, the NIV says, do not give the devil an opportunity. One translation says, do not give Satan a toehold. Do not give him a foothold. Okay? When we sin in our anger, then we're giving Satan a place of jurisdiction, a place to work in. Follow me? In your relationship, if you sin, or in your Christian life, in any relationships, if you sin, then you're giving Satan a place or a, an area of jurisdiction in that place. All right? You follow me thus far? Okay, good. Um, so what are some of those strongholds? For instance... Bitterness. I don't want to ask you this question, but I wonder how many of us harbor some bitterness somewhere in our heart towards somebody in our past. It amazes me how many people do. Uh, you all know Henry Thiessen from Durango, Nueva Del Durango, right? I don't know if he's ever spoken here or not, but... He, uh, we had him last year for our missions conference, and we had him speak in our church, and he spoke on forgiveness. Forgiveness is the process of dealing with bitterness. Hebrews 12, verse 15, see to it that no one misses the grace of God, that no root of bitterness take hold, causing trouble, and by it many be defiled. It will ruin a lot of relationships Bitterness is unforgiveness and is a stronghold. Pride, if we are proud, too proud to admit our part of the problem or our failure, our mistake. Rebellion. Um, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Samuel says to King Saul that rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft is working under Satan's authority. Rebellion is what Satan's attitude was when he decided to, that he wanted to be above God. All right? False values. When we begin to get, try to get things from things rather than from God. If I just had a new truck, then I'd be happy. Some wives are saying to their husbands, if I just had a new house like the neighbors, then I'd be happy. Then, then I'd be a better wife. Uh, you know, uh, uh, false values, when we are trying to find love, joy, peace, whatever, from things. Immorality, pornography, uh, lust, uh, adultery, all, all these things, that's uh, immorality. Sins of the forefathers. Some of the sins of the forefathers are passed on to the children up to the third and fourth generation. Ephesians, no, uh, Exodus 20, verse 5, all right? Uh, sinful habits, uh, having habits in your life that you know are wrong, that you know are sin, but not being able to quit, occult involvement, negative thoughts. You also don't have to answer this one, but I wonder how many of you are sitting here today that deep down inside you grew up believing that nobody loves me, that I can't do anything right, that I'm no good, that I'm not worth loving. There's, there's a lot of people that have these negative, that really believe some of these things. And then hypocrisy, pretending to be something that you're not. Look, this is how it works. Let's say this is your soul. This is your mind, the way you think, and your, your, your feelings, your emotions, and your way of making decisions. And something happens, and you get angry, and, you're, and, you, and you sin in your anger, and you're giving Satan a room or a place of jurisdiction. In that area of your soul, Satan now has the right to work because through your sin, you gave it to him. All right? You invited him through your sin into this room of your life. Now he's in here, and you know that once the person has his foot, has a toehold, a foothold into your life, 
dann konnte sich die wieder in den Varien, right? So through that anger, that sin of anger, he pushes you and you become bitter. And there's a bitter root that begins to grow. And you know that a bitter root that grows never stays small, that it just keeps growing and growing and eventually becomes a big tree. But you become very uh, proud because, well, I'm not that bad of a person like that person is. And on and on it goes. We become rebellious, and Satan just seeks to go further and further and take more and more and more room in your soul. And you know what happens? The person becomes more and more disgruntled, more and more difficult to live with. And there's less and less joy and less and less peace and less and less real love. And we think that it's all, or we may just be blaming our spouse. That's why our marriage, oh, I just married the wrong person. I wonder how many here have ever said that. I think I just married the wrong, I didn't mar marry the person that God wanted me to marry. I've had people in my office that, that wanted to tell, that wanted me to tell them, it's okay for you to get divorced because you, yeah, you're right. You did not marry the right person. And they gave me all these reasons why that wasn't the right person. And, and so sometimes I just simply ask the question, what were you thinking when you got married to them in the first place? That's when you should have been asking these questions. Once you're married and, and you made a covenant before God, you, this is now the right person. So parents, if your kids aren't married yet, please help them ask the right questions before they get married, okay? Uh, let's not do it later. So we want to talk about some of these strongholds that Satan may have gained in our life, in our past, over the next number of sessions. Tomorrow we want to talk about, I don't even know, what's the topic tomorrow? Um, we want to talk about moral failure, immorality. Can it be resolved? Is there hope for it? If there has been adultery in a marriage, yes, it can be. I totally, absolutely believe that. That even if there's been adultery and so on, it can be resolved. The, 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 the couple can come to that place where they genuinely, deeply, deeply love each other, maybe more and deeper than they ever did before. It's totally possible. And so, um, so here's some things I, I believe need to happen if we want to clean up some of these strongholds. If you know that you have become very bitter against your spouse... One of the things, the first thing you want to do is you want to confess to God your bitterness. Because first of all, you need to own the problem, your side of the problem, and that is that there's bitterness in your heart and that bitterness on your part is sin. Now listen, that does not mean that the spouse did not do what they did. That does not mean that the spouse is not wrong after all in what they did. We simply want to start with owning up owning our part of the problem. And if there is, let's say, bitterness, I confess my sin to God, and then I, uh, the second step then is, ask God to forgive me for my bitterness. We know that. This is a simple reminder. We know all this. But to come to that place where from the bottom of our heart we come to be broken and the realization that this bitterness in my heart, that is my sin. Thank God for forgiving your sin. Acknowledge that you have given Satan jurisdiction or room through that sin. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go through this in just a second here. Ask God to take back the room or the place or the opportunity or the toehold, whatever you want to call it, given to Satan through that sin, and then surrender that place to God or that room to God. And invite the Holy Spirit to fill that room with his presence And then here's two things to help fight it, and that is uh, to memorize and meditate on the Word of God daily. As you're cleaning out strongholds, you want to fill it with the Word of God. Thirdly, uh, or ninth, choose a prayer target. Now let me just illustrate this. Uh, da -da 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 -da. I'll bypass all this here. Let me just illustrate this, and then we'll close. Years ago, I, I needed... I came to the realization when I was learning this that one of the things that I had in my heart was bitterness. Um, 
I had a, this huge war that was going on in me, and I, my wife and I, we were struggling, and we had some very, very serious, very painful discussions. Uh, and, 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 and I realized that a, a big part of that was, was that I, as a husband, I was the head of the home, and somehow, spiritually, I had gotten so far away from God that Satan could do this kind of damage in my marriage. And after one of those painful discussions one night, I went for a long, long walk with God, and I prayed and I cried before God, and just asking God, God, show me, what is it? Teach me to win this war that's going on inside of me. To, you know, because I know it's possible, and whatever it takes, I'll do it. And a few months later, I had an opportunity, or we had an opportunity to go to a seminar in Toronto. This is in Canada, and, uh, and learn th- this principle about reclaiming surrendered ground. And this speaker explained that to us. And so one of the things that I recognized at that time is that I had a lot of bitterness. And let me just illustrate one of those bitternesses. When we were growing up in Mexico, my parents were not together, okay? We couldn't, uh, often we couldn't pay our school money. And because my parents weren't together and stuff like that, there's a lot of talk that goes around in the community, especially Mennonite communities. And there were some things said about my family that hurt very deeply. One of the leaders of the church came to our house one day and said some things about one of my sisters that hurt very, very deeply. And I all of a sudden realized that I carried some bitterness in my heart towards that church leader. Here, I was just a boy then. Here, years later, I'm now a married guy, and I have gone to Bible college And I've always said to God, I'll do anything you want me to do, but please don't ever, I don't want to ever preach or be a pastor. I literally said that. Years later, I find out it's because I carried this bitterness towards church leaders back then. But when I recognized the bitterness, what I did is this is, God, I want to acknowledge to you today from the bottom of my heart that I have bitterness in my heart. I know I'm bitter. And I want to ask you today, if you would be willing, if, if you would please forgive me for this bitterness. But God, I realize that I've given Satan an opportunity into my life. By my sin of bitterness, I opened the door for Satan to take this room in my heart, in my soul, about this bitterness. Would you today, because of the blood of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus Christ, take back that jurisdiction that I gave him, that place I gave him? I surrender that now to your control. Would you please just free me from that hurt and from that bitterness? I choose today to forgive that church leader for what he said. I let it go. But God, would you bring healing to my heart and would you just give me a love instead for that person? Oh, and then I remembered another bitterness towards my dad for leaving, towards my mom for some things and towards my brother for some of the fights we had had and stuff and all kinds of things. And each one by one, I just confessed them to God and asked him to forgive me and, and just asked him if he would take back the places I had given to Satan, those opportunities I had given Satan into my life through the, the sin and just surrender it back to him. I did that with bitterness. I did that with, with uh, lust uh, I had uh, committed. I did it w- with different things. And uh, I can just tell you, oh, and then... Because I was cleaning out, I didn't want to leave it empty. I started to memorize scripture, memorize scripture, and plant it in my heart and, and meditate on it, meditate on it, because I wanted not to be empty, I wanted to be full. And then when the temptation to be bitter came again, I would immediately, or when, when the temptation to lust came, then I would immediately pray. It says, God, I want to right now pray for a so and so person who is not a Christian. I pray that they would come to know you as Lord. And Lord, if you want to use me, here I am. And in the meantime, this temptation to lust passed. And just every temptation that came to be angry or, or, or to become bitter, I would just pray. I would pray for my dad. I would pray for my mom. I would pray for my family. I would, I would pray for prayer targets. Anytime I felt that temptation coming on, I would start to pray. And about two or three weeks later, after cleaning, praying through and lots and lots and lots of junk in my life, I began to experience a joy and a peace like I had never, never, ever felt before. I've been a Christian for many years. I'd been in Bible college for four years. I'd been a youth leader for four years together with my wife. And I met my wife and we were married, but there were, 
I all of a sudden realized how many problems I was contributing to in, in our marriage. Now, that didn't mean our marriage was instantly perfect, right? The only thing is that from that point on, we began to be, I began to be more free to grow in my relationship with my wife. I began to handle, slowly over time, began to handle things differently. And she'll tell you, and I can tell you, that I am not at all a perfect man, not even close. I may be a pastor, but (laughs) I'm no different than anybody else. But I, I would venture to say, from my point of view in our relationship, that our relationship is way better now than it was when we got married. We handle our problems differently now. We do talk about them. And sometimes it still hurts. Sometimes it's still hard. But there's hope. There's always hope. Amen? Let's all uh, pray together. Heavenly Father, as we um, bow before you right now, I just want to so thank you Thank you that you have shown us in your word how Satan works. And you've given us prayer, the truth of your word, to set us free. You say in your word that if we will abide in your word, then we will know the truth. And the truth will set us free. And I pray today that uh, as we go through the rest of this week and talk about different specific problems in marriage like moral failure or bitterness I pray Father that you would guide us give us an open heart to see our own heart in our own place in our relationship with our spouse and I pray that every single couple that's represented here today that they would this would just be one more step to for the marriage to get even better. If it's already good to get even better and if there are issues to gain hope that there are answers to these problems. Thank you, Lord, for what you will do. Amen.